This is the third in a series of lessons about how to use RATSTAT software. In today's lesson, we will learn about sample size determination for estimating overpayment amounts from a simple random sample. RATSTAT provides two modules for determining the sample size in these situations. The first option is to use a probe sample. The second is to use an estimated error rate. The key difference between these options is that the estimated error rate option is based on transaction amounts rather than amount, error amounts in your sampling frame. As a reminder, the sampling frame is a list of items that you will pull your sample from. The probe sample option requires that you have a rough estimate of the average error amount in your sampling frame and the standard deviation of the error amounts in your sampling frame. Generally, you would only have this type of information if you pulled a probe sample, which is the reason for calling this the probe sample option. Now let's go through the specifics about how to use the estimated error rate module. We can see from this screen that the module requires six inputs the universe size, the estimated error rate, the total of all transactions in the sampling frame, the standard deviation of all transactions in the sampling frame, the confidence level, and the precision. I will walk through each of these inputs, but first it is important to consider the limitations of this module. Critically, the module assumes that all of the items in your sampling frame are 100% correct or 100% in error. It further assumes that high and low dollar transactions have roughly the same chance of being in error. For example, suppose my sampling frame includes a $1 transaction and a $1,000 transaction. This module assumes that the $1 and $1,000 transactions have roughly the same chance of being in error. Moreover, it assumes that if the transactions are in error, then the entire amount is in error. The $1 transaction would have a $1 error and the $1,000 transaction would have a $1,000 error. The errors are not all or nothing and the sample sizes produced by the module will tend to be larger than necessary to meet the target precision. In other words, the primary issue with violations of the all or nothing assumption is that RATSTATS will suggest a larger sample size than what you would otherwise need. Remember, there's two different assumptions. In addition to assuming that the errors are all or nothing, the module also assumes the error rate does not depend on the error amounts of the transactions. If the error rate is higher for lower dollar transactions, then the sample size recommended by RATSTATS may be too small to meet the target precision. In the above case, the issue would arise if the $1 transaction is more likely to be an error than the $1,000 transaction. Let's move on to looking at the specific input fields. Universe size is just the total number of items in the list that you plan to pull your sample from. The term universe here is the same as the term sampling frame. For this example, I'll use a value of 30,000. The anticipated error rate is the expected dollar value error rate in your sampling frame. You will not know this number beforehand. You will have to pick the number based on your experience in the area or based on previous reviews. Generally, the smaller the error rate, the larger the recommended sample size will be. As a result, if you want to be conservative, you should select an error rate that is on the lower end of what you might expect to observe. For this example, I will use an anticipated error rate of 40%. The total amount is the sum of all the transactions in the list you plan to pull your sample from. Critically, this number is not the expected error amounts, rather it's the full transaction amounts. You should be able to sum the transaction amounts field in your sampling frame to obtain this number. For this example, I'll use a value of 5 million. The standard deviation is very similar. The only difference is that rather than being the sum of the transaction amounts in a sampling frame, it is the standard deviation of the transaction amount field. For this example, I will use a value of 100. Both the sum and the standard deviation can be calculated using any standard spreadsheet, database, or data analytics software. Next, we need to select a confidence level. Most organizations use either a 95 or 90% 90 confidence level. One potentially confusing point is that these confidence levels assume a two-sided confidence interval. If you're calculating a one-sided interval, you'll need to look up what the two-sided equivalent is. For example, a one-sided 90% confidence interval is equivalent to a two-sided 80% confidence interval, and a one-sided 95% confidence interval is equivalent to a two-sided 90% confidence interval. The confidence level represents the percent of time that you would expect your confidence interval to contain the target population value of interest. For example, suppose I'm estimating the total amount properly paid to a provider. If I repeated my sample many times, I would expect the 90% confidence interval calculated from my sample to contain the actual amount properly paid about 90% of the time. In most cases, the confidence level is fixed based on policy and is not selected separately for each sample. 
One of the most common mistakes is to confuse the confidence level and the precision. If you're not familiar with these terms, I recommend reading about them further. The final input is the precision. The precision represents how close the estimate will tend to be to the population quantity of interest. For the purpose of this module, the precision is measured as the half width of the confidence interval. For example, suppose I estimate that the frame contains $1 million in overpayments and my confidence interval ranges from 850,000 to 1.15 million. The interval is plus or minus 150,000 around the point estimate. The precision would then be 15%, 150,000 divided by 1 million. The better the precision, the more narrow the confidence interval, and the closer the estimate will tend to be to the actual frame amount that I'm trying to estimate. Each time the sample size is increased by one item, the precision will tend to get incrementally better. In some situations, there are specific precision cutoffs required by policy. Otherwise, you'll need to select your precision based on how close you want your estimate to be to the actual population total of interest. For example, do you need your estimate within 10% of the actual error amount, 5%, or another number entirely? One point to keep in mind is that the precision of your sample will be calculated out of the estimated total. If your estimate is 1 million, then a 10% precision would be 100,000. Meanwhile, if your estimate is 100,000, then a 10% precision would be 10,000. Once you set the values, decide how to output your results. Let's see what the results look like for this example case. The results are presented in a grid where the rows represent precision and the columns the confidence interval. For example, if I want a sample size where the confidence interval will contain the true value about 90% of the time and be plus or minus 10% around the point estimate, then I will pull a sample of 636 items. As before, these intervals are two-sided. If you would like a one-sided interval, then you will need to adjust the confidence level accordingly. The 80% column equates to a one-sided 90% confidence interval, and the 90% column equates to a one-sided 95% confidence interval. If I want a sample where a one-sided confidence interval will contain the true value 90% of the time and is within 15% of the point estimate, I would pull a sample of 174 items. The numbers at the bottom of the output screen are what the software estimates the mean and the standard deviation of the error amounts in your frame will be. It calculates these numbers using the estimated error rate and the population totals you entered along with the assumption that the errors will be all or nothing and that the error rate will not depend on the transaction amount. We discussed these latter two assumptions earlier in the class. Sometimes users enter in their target values and get a sample size that is very large, perhaps even equal to the number of items in the sampling frame. In these situations, you have several options. You could work with a statistician to develop a more efficient sampling design or estimate methodology. Alternatively, you could identify the precision that you are able to reasonably meet and consider whether that precision is sufficient for your goals. The flexibility regarding the precision depends heavily on how you plan to use the results of your sample. For example, there's a regulatory requirement that you calculate the sample with a plus or minus 10% precision, you would be set at that amount. Conversely, if you're not in a strict regulatory environment and merely want to confirm a particular problem exists, then you may be fine with a much wider precision. Also, the precision may be less important if you're willing to make your decision given the upper and lower limits of your confidence. That's about all you need to know for this module. Let's move on to the probe error rate module. The key difference between this module and the anticipated error rate module is that for this module, you need to have information about the average and standard deviation of the error amounts in your frame. In the anticipated error rate module, you will only need to know about the error rate. The other information required for that module came from the transaction amounts in your sampling frame. Of course, if we had the average error amounts in our sampling frame, then we wouldn't need to pull the sample to begin with. This is where the probe sample comes in. The idea is that you pull a small number of items, for example 30. The idea is that you pull a small number of items, for example 30, and use those items to get a rough estimate of the average and standard deviation of the error amounts in the sampling frame. You then enter these numbers into the module to see the sample size you would need to meet your target precision and confidence level. The advantage of this module is that it does not make any assumptions about the error in the sampling frame other than that those errors are similar in composition to the errors in your sample. The larger the probe sample, the more likely the sample size from this module will provide the precision that you're looking for. Generally, your precision will end up worse than expected if the error amounts in your frame are more variable or are lower than the error amounts in the sample. Now let's look at a specific example. For the first example, I will use the no probe sample file option. 
When I click this option, a box appears for the universe size. For this box, I need the total number of items in the list that the sample will be pulled from. For this example, I'll use a value of 30,000. Next, I need to enter the confidence level and precision. These are the same as with the anticipated error rate file. Now when I click OK, it'll ask for the estimate of the universe mean. Critically, it is asking for the mean of the error amount, not the mean of the transaction amount. If you enter the mean of the transaction amounts, then you will vastly underestimate the sample size you will need to achieve your target precision and confidence level. I would get this number either by taking the average of my probe sample or by using other data that I have available about the error amounts in my sampling frame. For example, I could use error amounts from a past study of the same area. For this example, I will use 66.67. Finally, I have to enter the standard deviation of the error amounts in the universe. As before, you cannot use the standard deviation of the transaction amounts. For this example, I will use 100 as a standard deviation. The output screen is almost identical to the one for the anticipated error rate. The output screen is almost identical to the one for the anticipated error rate module and can be interpreted in a similar fashion. The only differences are the assumptions underlying the analysis. In this case, the assumption is that the mean and standard deviation of the error amounts in your frame match the mean and standard deviation of the error amounts in your probe sample or whatever other source you use for this module. Compare this to the anticipated error rate module, which made the assumption that errors are all or nothing and that the error rate did not depend on the transaction value. If you have enough information, this module will generally be preferable to the anticipated error rate module. In this example, I entered the average and standard deviation. You can also have RATSTATS calculate the average and standard deviation directly from a probe sample. Let's go back to the input screen and see how this feature works. We can see that the module allows for the probe sample to input in a text file, an Excel spreadsheet, or an access database. For this example, we will use an Excel file. Specifically, I have created a file called testcase.txt. XLSX that contains hypothetical error amounts from a probe sample. As you can see, the file contains nothing except for error values from my probe sample. Alternatively, I could have given the file a column header or an additional column with the ID numbers. Just to drive the point home, the file must contain error amounts that you expect to be similar to the error amounts in your sampling frame. If you enter transaction amounts or other values, then your results will not be meaningful. Going back to RATSTAT's input screen, let's input the file and click OK. RATSTAT then brings up a new input screen that lets us indicate whether the first row contains header information and the first column contains line numbers. Really, this panel is just letting us tell RATSTAT where the error amounts are in the input file. If we say the file contains a header, then RATSTAT will look for the error amount starting in the second row. If we say the file contains line numbers in the first column, then RATSTAT will look for the error amount starting in the second column. Finally, we need to enter the sample size for the probe sample. My probe sample had 30 items, so that is what I will enter in this last box. This brings us to the same output screen as before. This brings us to the same output screen as before, which can be interpreted in the same way. I could get these exact same results if I did not use the file, but instead entered the average and standard deviation into RAT sets using the no probe sample option within this module. This wraps up the discussion for today. To recap, there are two modules for determining the sample size for a dollar estimate based on a simple random sample. One module uses transaction amounts, not error amounts, along with an anticipated error rate. The second module uses error amounts based on a probe sample or similar source. Thank you for listening today. The next lesson will be about using the variable appraisal unrestricted module for estimating a dollar amount given the results of your sample.